Sure. We're going to tell Joel about Ms. Houston, who is a 74-year-old woman with a history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and CKD. She is on empagliflozin, lisinopril, amlodipine, corthaldone, metformin, insulin, and atorvastatin. Um, we let the metformin ride with an EGFR of 25. The A1C is 7.5. Her potassium is 4.7. You're not even creatinine ratio is 350. The blood pressure in the office is 129 over 79. We are considering considering adding phenerinone to her regimen. Um, <laughs> so I like this first question. What What is phenerinone? I mean, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know what it is. So if you could just sort of talk me through why I might think about that medication for this particular patient, that would help. And then we can delve deeper into it. Oh, okay. So uh, just... A little bit of catch-up history. You guys remember your basic renal hormones, and you've got uh, uh, angiotensinogen that is converted by uh, renin to angiotensin 1, which is converted by angiotensin-converting enzyme to angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is biologic, very biologically active throughout the kidney and throughout the vasculature as a vasoconstriction, and it causes a lot of salt retention. And one of his things is it stimulates the release of aldosterone, which then retains sodium, kicks out potassium, and then has some pro-fibrotic activity in the kidney and the heart. And so a lot of our modern therapies for heart failure and kidney disease is kind of to block aldosterone. And we do a lot of that through ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. And people said, wow, what if we combine them both? What if we use ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers? And that turned out to be a bad idea. Right, that didn't work out nearly as well as we had hoped. It reduced the protein, but increased hyperkalemia and acute kidney injury, and didn't seem to have an effect on kidney outcomes. And then, well, and then there was also direct renin inhibitors, and we also, excuse me, then there was also direct renin inhibitors. This is alescarin was the drug, and when we combined that with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, we ran into the exact same problem: acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, and that trial was stopped early. I think that trial was called Altitude. And then there was combining ACE inhibitors with aldosterone antagonists, so spironol spironolactone or eplerinone. And this has been successful in some cases, right? So we definitely have heart failure data where they're combining aldosterone antagonists and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers because that's just standard of care. And so the most famous one is the RALS trial. And then Ephesus was another one of those big trials. Top Hat was a trial. And these were, you know, there were significant amounts of hyperkalemia with this, but largely they were successful at slowing heart failure progression. But they never did a study looking at renal end outcomes using um, uh, mineral corticoid uh, antagonists and ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. People have kind of looked at the, um, the placebo-controlled mineral, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist trials to see if there was a kind of a kidney signal kind of buried in that heart failure data, and they really couldn't see that one. It didn't seem that nothing kind of panned out. But if you did prescribe these two drugs in patients that did have kidney disease, usually you were forced to stop because of hyperkalemia. Phenerinone is a novel mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. It is non-steroidal. It actually looks more like a calcium channel blocker than it does look like uh, a tr tr traditional MRA. And, um, and it blocks the mineral corticoid receptor activity. It seems to have a shorter half-life, and people thought that may be advantageous for hyperkalemia. It doesn't seem to have nearly as much effect on blood pressure, not no effect on blood pressure, but less effect than you see with Spiro um, is typically what it's compared to. And uh, and so um, the manufacturer of this drug, uh, Bayer, did two trials, one a cardiovascular trial and then another one a CKD trial. And they enrolled multi-thousands of patients to uh, phenerinone or placebo. They ran it for multiple years. I think uh, the uh, the CKD trial was called Fidelio, and it ran for 2.6 years. And the cardiovascular outcome was Figaro, and it ran for 3.4 years. And both trials were positive. It had a significant effect at reducing the composite outcome. For kidney disease, that composite outcome was death, dialysis, or a 40% reduction in EGFR. And that's kind of an FDA-established finish line for CKD drugs. If you can reduce that's that outcome. Make, right? Like the major oh, adverse kidney major events. Event. That's awful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to catch up with the cardiologist. That is a, that is a tragedy. <laughs> this is this is a pattern. I, I, when I was on the, in the 
Twitter conversation the other day where people were saying, instead of having CKD3, we should call it uh, CKD with preserved renal function. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh. I don't know. I'm a... <laughs> I can't with it. We'll be here like Kikita Perf and stuff in the clinic and I can't. I just don't, I don't have the Kikita story Perf, for it. Yeah, I was, I was just trying to go Perf. there, Paul. I was, I was trying to put something together. You beat me to it. <laughs> So, uh, and so, it, it, so for that composite outcome, so uh, it, death, dialysis, and a 40% reduction in EGFR, most of the people got there from that 40% reduction in EGFR. You can see that being an easier yeah. line to cross than uh, death or dialysis. Um, but for that composite outcome, it had a, a hazard ratio of 0.82, so about 18% reduction. So, it, you know, just under one in five patients, probably closer to one in six patients benefited, but this is for 2.6 years, right? That's so, you know, so if you're like, oh, it's a number needed to treat us, you know, um, well, it's a number needed to treat about 33 uh, to get one reduction of that outcome. But, you know, the thing about number needed to treat is it's limited for that time period of the study. And you know, you have a patient in, the, in your office who's 50 years old. You're like, well, how many how many 2.6 year follow ups are they going to have in their lifetime? Right? They're going to have eight or 12 of those. Yeah. And so you kind of and it's not clear we could truly stack them, but I think that's the kind of situation where number needed to treat kind of falls down when you really and you got to think about the cost as well of adding this you know the the patient's got to take this medicine we have monitor their potassium and the cost of it it logistically how how has it been to try to prescribe this as a nephrologist i don't know many primary care doctors are are using this yet yeah so i mean you know it it's it's new to the clinic i've i've prescribed it a handful of times um i think mainly what i'm doing when patients are coming in is first i want to get them Started on an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker is what I usually uh, reach for. Uh, then I want to um, I get them on an SGLT2 inhibitor. Then I cycle back to the ACE inhibitor and make sure it's maximized, right? There's no di dose titration with the SGLT2 inhibitors. You put them on a dose and you're done. But getting them on the SGLT2 inhibitor actually gives them a little bit more headroom for their potassium. And so that'll, that'll allow, that at that point, I ramp up the ACE inhibitor to the maximum tolerable dose. And one of the things that was kind of unique about uh, Figaro and Fidelio is they were very nervous about people saying, oh, you were only able to cross the finish line with this drug because you didn't get them on maximal ACE inhibition. And so they actually spent up to 16 weeks in a, um, in a placebo uh, run-in where all they did was maximize the ACE inhibition, four months of just maximizing the ACE or angiotensin receptor blocker. And so unlike most trials where they just say they're on maximal drug, <laughs> they actually really pushed it, made sure they were on a maximal drug before they got enrolled. And so I kind of say, well, if that's how they did the trial, that's what I'm going to do. Once I have them on the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, once I have them on maximal RAS inhibition, I, uh, I take a look at their blood pressure, right? Because these drugs are not great blood pressure uh, uh, drugs. And if their blood pressure is still not controlled, I'm probably going to reach for uh, a, a spironolactone or a nepleurinone, a drug that uh, has better blood pressure track record. Um, and these are, and, and, you know, CKD is one of the most common causes of resistant hypertension, which is, you know, the quote, quote, secondary causes of hypertension is going to be chronic kidney disease. And we know that the, that spironolactone is a great drug there. And so that's usually if their blood pressure is still not controlled, potassium looks okay. That's what I would add. However, blood pressure controlled, maximal ACE on an SGLT2 inhibitor, and they still have residual proteinuria, I'm going to reach for. Uh, or at least talk to them about finerenone at that point. So you're saying that the finerenone has a better track record for someone with residual albuminuria than somebody if than giving spironolactone or a plerinone? What I'm saying is that they they were able to cross the finish line in these these two trials, Finer, uh, Fidelio and Figaro, and Got it. None, they haven't been able to really show that with the other drugs, right? Oh, okay. Got and it. so. If and you know, if I have uh, you know pretty significant blood pressure that still needs to be treated, I'm not going to be reaching for finerenone. I you know they did the study; it didn't have much of an effect on blood pressure. It's not going to be the drug that I'm going to reach for. Um, but if their blood pressure is controlled by other means or what have you, 
they still have residual proteinuria. And I'm looking at a patient, you know, I do that calculation, like, you know, 15%, 20% uh, risk. I actually calculated for this woman. This woman has a 10% two-year risk of dialysis and a 26% five-year risk of dialysis. And she's already on uh, uh, ACE inhibitor. She's already on SGLT2 inhibitor. And she's going to ask you, well, what, what else can we do? Are we just going to sit here and wait for that to happen? Mm. You know, those, those are pretty significant risks. I said, actually, there's another thing we can do. 